And then there's observational data, for example, associations. So if you think about you know, vitamin D is one we'll talk about in detail, so that vitamin, low levels of vitamin D are associated with depression, for example. Right? So there are other possibilities. Maybe people who have low levels of vitamin D stay inside. Maybe people with high levels of vitamin D are exercising. Maybe that's the actual answer. So you have to be very cautious even with observational evidence. So there's a way to summarize that is to say association is not causation. And so you have to, but it's interesting. And so these up to here, these are really hypothesis generating kinds of evidence. So and it probably, I think it's along a continuum. And maybe observational evidence is enough with something that has very low risk. And then hypothesis testing, that's when you do a randomized controlled clinical trial. That's what I was talking about before, where you randomly assign people to one of two groups, either to receive an active therapy or an inactive therapy. The patients don't know whether they're getting active therapy or not. And the people doing the measurements, evaluating whether somebody's getting better, don't know who is getting the treatment and who is getting the placebo. And this is hypothesis testing, so if something goes through this process, as all of the FDA-approved therapies have, at least for certain kinds of MS, then we can assume that the hypothesis is true, that these medications are effective. Okay, so now we're going to kind of jump right in to talk about some specific things. So we'll start with vitamin D. And obviously, just to kind of be clear up front, there's no question of whether vitamin D is good for you. It's a vitamin. If you don't have it, as a child, you'll have rickets, or there's an adult version of that too. So the question is, is vitamin D good for other, is, is what dose of vitamin D is useful, and for what purpose? And those are really interesting questions. But just to be clear, of course vitamin D is essential for health. The question is how much? And I think it would just take a second to talk about where people get vitamin D. So you can get vitamin D, of course, from the sun, but it's not as obvious as the answer, that's an incomplete answer, that at this latitude, you can't make vitamin D from the sun in the wintertime. And I don't know how to adjust for the latitude of Colorado, but it really doesn't matter because most of us are wearing clothes in the wintertime, right? And so we're indoors staying in, indoors most of the time. So in other words, very little vitamin D, practically speaking, can be obtained from the sun. Very little of it is available in food. So most of the time, what you're talking about is whether or not to supplement with vitamin D and to what extent. Although, in the summertime, your body is extremely efficient at making vitamin D when you go outside, just even for 20 or 25 minutes. And so maybe we have to unlearn some rules about sunscreen, certainly cover our faces maybe, and, but leave some our legs and arms exposed for 20 minutes a day or something like that, at least in the summertime, and then we're able to store that, hopefully, and, hope, and get us through the winter. So for MS, there, I mean, again, we're going to get to some interesting, I think, randomized controlled clinical trials of vitamin D, but just by way of background, there is animal evidence, so if you give the animal, uh, animals don't get, get MS, but you can give them a disease that looks a lot like MS. And then if you give them vitamin D, that improves their condition. And then if you take it away again, it worsens it, worsens it. so it's effective in the animal model of MS. And then there's observational evidence, I think really fascinating observational evidence about this. So the mo there have been a number, as there, you know, a lot of people who have MS will know already there's a geographical gradient, so the further north or south you go from the equator, the greater the risk of MS. And one potential way of explaining that is that people who live further from the equator have lower vitamin D stores, and maybe that's part of why MS develops or um, is more severe, possibly. So that's observational evidence. We already talked about some of the flaws with that, so it may be that there's some other explanation, but it just is a coincidence that the vitamin D relates to incidence of MS in certain areas. And then um, I think the most interesting piece of the observational story um, was, done, was a study done among people in the military. So people 
who was a, a researcher, matched people with MS and people who didn't have MS, all of whom had been in the military. And then he went back, and it's remarkable, apparently the military has blood samples from everyone who's ever gone through. And so people, I, I presume, at age 17 or 18, had, to, had their blood taken and stored. And then you know, at the age of 40, looking back, now we've got people with MS and people who don't have MS, you can go back and get that blood. And it turns out that the people who had the highest level of vitamin D were the least likely to get MS and vice versa too. So there was a 60% effect for, of protection apparently among the people who were in the highest levels of vitamin D. The top 20% of people with vitamin D levels were 60% less likely to have MS. So it may be part of the story of how MS evolves or develops. But again, that's observational evidence. There's also now some genetic evidence. Just this year, some people, uh, there are families with MS. And in those families with MS, there is a genetic disorder. There's a genetic, there's a genetic mutation that fails, that prevents the, um, the coding for an enzyme that converts one form of vitamin D in the body, 25-hydroxy vitamin D, to the active form of vitamin D, which is calcitriol. And so that this, the people who can't do that get MS at a very high rate, and you have families with MS. So again, that's a very compelling story so far, right? So why is vitamin D not a treatment for MS? Well, maybe it is, but the answer, at least in short, is that there haven't been sufficient high-quality randomized controlled clinical trials yet. But there have been a few, as I learned just this week when I was trying to update my uh, slides on this subject. So there was a study re pretty recently reported of vitamin D2, and a very small number of people, 23 people, half of the group was given 1,000 IU of vitamin D2, and I think that's important, and I'll explain why. The other half of the group was given 6,000 IU of vitamin D for, an, again, pretty short study, six months. And they made, but they had MRI measure, which is a very sensitive measure of change. And the authors noted that there was no difference in the number of gadolinium enhancing, enhancing lesions over that relatively short period of time. And as I read the uh, conclusion, it said, this provides class one evidence that vitamin D is not helpful for people with MS. And that's, that's just patently not true. This is a very small group of people. I also point out that most of these people were on GA as glutyrimer acetate, that's Copaxone, or interferon. And so it was essentially an add-on study. And that's pretty much the future of vitamin D. I don't think that it will ever be monotherapy or something that allows you to not use any of the FDA therapies, but there may, there's an, still a potential role for it as add-on therapy. So there was another study done here. <clears throat> this one involved 66 people, all of whom were on beta serum. This was one year. Half were given vitamin D, the other half were not. They were given placebo. And they measured the burden of disease on MRI. And this study, in contrast to the previous one, did find an effect. So that the people who were taking vitamin D supplements at 20,000 IU per week, that comes out to about 3,000 IU per day, which is a pretty reasonable dose, did better than the people who were given placebo. Uh, and all of them, again, were on uh, Rebif. So it's, uh, these studies are obviously in tension. There was, you can see at the bottom, there's some other interesting information. There was a trend towards less disability in that group, so a clinical measure. So this is a pretty exciting study, also small though only 66 people. <clears throat> um, I want to take a second to talk about the difference between vitamin D2 and D3, which is another reason that I think this study um, is probably not as important as the other one. So vitamin D, there are two kinds of vitamin D that are taken orally um, as supplements. So there's vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 is um, Cholecalciferol, also known as, you don't have to know that. And then D2 is uh, aerocholecalciferol. And 
The D2 is available by prescription. You usually take 50,000 IU once per week. And the D3 is available over the counter, and that's taken on a daily basis, usually. There is a very interesting meta-analysis of other studies, so a study of studies, showing that up to a point, there is an in there, so let me see if I can draw this out for you. I wish I had a, um, a slide showing this, but if you have mortality, that's death rate on, on this side of a graph, and if you have vitamin D levels, blood levels of vitamin D on this side of the graph, it kind of goes like this. So mortality is high when vitamin D is low, and it scoots down like that. So in other words, it seems that higher levels of vitamin D are protective. And I think this was one of the major studies that got people interested generally in vitamin D and the general health benefits of vitamin D. Well, then there was another study that I don't think got very much attention which then broke out that information in terms of vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. And the people who were taking vitamin D2 did not have there, there was that same curve was different. In other words, vitamin D2 was associated with a slight increase in all-cause mortality. So to me, it seems like there's very little reason, and respectfully to people who are taking the D2, it seems to me very little reason to be taking vitamin D2 when vitamin D3 seems safer, it's very cheap, and you can take a lot of it to bring your blood levels up fast. So when I see this study of vitamin D2, I wonder whether that's another issue too. So I think that we have to be careful not to lump all vitamin D studies together. There may be important differences between vitamin D2 and vitamin D3.